Amen. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and uh, oh, what a good night. Man, God is so good, and good spirit on our church, the Lord's working in our church. Sunday night church service, maybe the highlight of the week, and uh, one of my favorite services. But tonight, I am preaching on a common sin, uh, a sin that's found in churches, it's found in homes, it's found in individual lives, and this sin causes us to lose the blessings of the Almighty God. It is a sin that we often nurture it, we fertilize it, we, it's often even encouraged, and it's a sin that has destroyed, once again, many churches, many families, many homes. It's a sin that can and should be avoided, and tonight's message is uh, on the wicked, rotten, vile, terrible, horrible sin of rebellion. And right here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll go over this story, but let's uh, stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll read one verse, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 23. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 23. Ready? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being kin. And you see that right there, rebellion. Uh, the sin of rebellion, it says the sin of witchcraft and the wicked, rotten, vile, terrible sin of rebellion. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And at first glimpse, maybe the sin of rebellion didn't seem like that big of a deal for King Saul. But the end of it was bitterness. The end of it was a really a wasted life. And Lord, I pray that you help us to see sin as it is. It's exceeding sinful, Lord. And God, I pray that you help our church to be very careful of the sin of rebellion against you. Help many families see their rebellion against you destroys many people, Lord. And help the individuals of the church be reminded of the danger of the sin of rebellion. Lord, we need you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, the sin of rebellion. And I, I've preached on this subject of rebellion a lot over the many years I've been in the ministry. Uh, matter of fact, this chapter of Scripture I have preached out of 1 Samuel chapter 15 several different times. I've counseled uh, many rebels over the years. I have been a rebel at various different stages of my life, guilty as charged. And I've sadly pastored a few rebellious people over the years in this church. I've watched many young Christians grow up and rebel against uh, the God of their parents. And I've seen parents, by the way, and pastors uh, provoke their children and their church members to rebellion. And many have done it not only once, uh, but they've done it over and over. And, and you think about it, I at certain times have been guilty with my children in provoking them to wrath. And I have at many, times too often provoked church members to wrath. Uh, but rebellion is dangerous. Amen. 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 All right, we got to get that. Rebellion Amen. is dangerous. Amen. Help me out this evening. It's going to be a really long sermon Ha, rebellion is dangerous. Amen. We're getting there. Rebellion is destructive. Amen. And rebellion is a sin that hurts churches, families, and individuals. And we are all prone to rebellion. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Proverbs chapter 16 gives us the root of rebellion. It says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So if the sin of rebellion is so wicked, so rotten, so vile, it would do us a, a, a good, or be a good idea tonight to figure out what is a rebel, why do people rebel, and what are the results of rebellion, and how can I, how can you stay away from this sin of rebellion? So as we delve further into this truth of the sin of rebellion, we are looking here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we look at King Saul, and we're going to go through the story quickly, but God, uh, Saul was God's chosen man to be king. We think, amen. 
All right, we had too much fun earlier. It's the preaching. I just see we, we're silently going to sleep quickly here. But, but Saul, King Saul, was God's chosen man. God appointed Saul to be king of Israel. Amen. Amen. And God had a plan for him. God had a purpose for him. God had a, a reason for him to be king. And uh, we begin to look through that. And as he became king, the Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. But uh, God, as he gave him instructions as being king, he, he gave him instructions through God's word, God's man. He instructed them what to do. In other words, God's chosen man uh, was given God's chosen plan to follow. Okay, Amen. slowly getting there. God's chosen man uh, was instructed by God. God instructed Saul exactly what to do and how to do it. In verse number three, it says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not. But slay both man and woman. Infant. And suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And all of a sudden you begin to think about this. Saul was given some instructions. Some instructions in some ways that were hard. In some ways that were difficult. Uh, and, and it's sad, it doesn't seem in the story that the children of God had a problem killing the infants. They didn't have a problem with that part, but they did have a problem with killing the fatted calf, you might say, or the big sheep. And we begin to follow along with this. God's chosen man was given God's chosen plan to follow. And then rebellion began in verse number 9, but Paul, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and rebellion. God's chosen man rebelled against God. God's chosen man rebelled against God. Then the pain of rebellion, chapter 15, verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came unto Samuel saying, and you begin to see this. It says, Samuel, he cried unto the Lord all night. And Samuel saw God's man all of a sudden rebelling against God, and it grieved him. He saw this. He knew the results of this sin. He knew the results of rebellion. And all oh, the man of God began to uh, be, feel the pain of rebellion. And then the little lies of rebellion. As we go through this quickly, the little lies of rebellion. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a... Uh, up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And the little lies begin. I did what I was supposed to do when I was supposed to do it. And as it goes a little further, uh, Samuel begins to think about what was said. And he begins to uh, question him. And uh, by the way, he goes to the Lord about it. And then we look at the why of rebellion. Why? Why the rebellion? And it says in verse 17, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, and was uh, thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the, the why of rebellion is pride. The why of rebellion is Saul lifting himself above the word of God. And then we get the uh, Samuel going back to him, and as we're going through this, we see the continued little lies. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amala, 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 Amalekites. Amalekites. Say that with me. Amalekites. Thank you. Amalekites. Amalekites. Don't correct the pastor tonight. That's, you're rebelling. Praise the Lord. Uh, but God expects obedience. He blamed the people, and it was a little lie, but God simply expects obedience. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is a very wicked, rotten sin, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and adultery. And the why of rebel rebellion, part two, uh, Saul said, well, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And the Bible tells us very clearly, the fear of man bringeth a snare. And so the consequences of rebellion. Oh, hey, Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. I want to get to that story quickly, but it's very simple. 
King Saul was God's anointed man. God didn't leave him without instruction. He instructed him exactly what to do. It was in some ways hard, hard. Kill the, not only all the Amalekites, but kill the infants. Kill all their sheep, all their fatlings, everything. Uh, Saul willingly and deliberately rebelled against God. He made excuses for it, little lies for it. He was confronted by God's man, and, and he really had him out right there, but uh, he kept lying and lying. And then we find the sin of rebellion. It's wicked and it's rotten. Now, here's some simple thoughts about rebellion, okay? We're going to go through this, and this is important. Some simple thoughts about rebellion. Unsaved people are rebels. Okay, number one, unsaved people are rebels. They are in rebellion against God. When you begin to look at John 3, 16, a famous verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him is, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life, it goes a little bit further in that, and it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And unsaved people, they, they like to live for their lusts. They hide from God's Word. They rebel against God's Word. They refuse to trust Christ as their Savior because of their lusts, their desires uh, for their, their living their lives their own way, their evil ways right there. An unsaved person lives for their lusts. Understand that? An unsaved person lives for their lusts. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says it like this. It says, ye walked according to the course of this world. A little bit later, it says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's saying, hey, you did that. You used to walk, but praise God, you got saved. But the unsaved are in rebellion against God. When we get saved, our old nature does not go away. However, God does give us tools and the ability through the power of His Word and the Holy Spirit not to live in our lusts or for our lusts. So that's important. Now Saul in the Bible was a saved man. Okay? Now some of you are not going to get that at first, but Saul was saved. Saul went to heaven. He mentioned being with Samuel later on in his life when I'm going to be with you. And he went to heaven. But Saul, the saved man, lived a life of rebellion. So why did King Saul live a life of rebellion? That, that's a good question, isn't it? Why did he? Now, here, listen to this statement. It's going to sound really negative and mean at first. And it is. Most people, listen, most people who profess to be saved do not have a real relationship with the Lord. I should say it like this. They, most people who profess to be saved don't have a real, consistent relationship with the Lord. And I wish I didn't have to say it. I, didn't, I wish I didn't have to think that. But after being saved for 23 years, I believe that statement is absolutely true. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you've been saved for any amount of time, over the years you've seen good men, good women, fall into terrible, wicked, rotten, vile sin. And the sad fact, it's not a once every five year thing. It's not a once every ten year thing. It's not even a once a year thing. It's sadly week after week after week after week after week, Good people all of a sudden turning and becoming rebellion or rebelling against the Almighty God. Terrible, is it not? So why? Well, I'll say it again. Most people who profess to be saved do not have a real, consistent, intimate, personal, passionate relationship with the Lord. Most rebels, even Christian rebels, don't even know, know what it is it means to have a walk with the Lord. Now listen to this. Most, most rebels, most rebels, the problem is they don't even know what it means to walk with the Lord. They don't even know what that means. Now, to prove the point there, and not to belabor this and bore you even more, but if you take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want to read a grand portion of Scripture, a lot of Scripture. And by the way, a rebel won't even pay attention to these verses right there. Won't take the time to concentrate on the very words of God that God has given us right here. But this is, this is powerful. Remember what I'm saying here. I'll say it again. Most people who profess to be saved do not have a real, consistent, intimate, personal, passionate relationship with the Almighty God. They don't even know what that means. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind, this is a real relationship with God. This is not a joke. This is not a once a week Christianity. This is an every day, every morning, every afternoon, every night relationship with the Almighty God. And thou shalt write them, uh, well, verse 8, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and, and it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. Stop right there. Hey, you're going to go in the promised land, and God's going to give you something wonderful. You didn't even build it, and he, he's already got it taken care of for you. Okay, verse 11. And houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive, olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Stop. God's been good to you. God's been good to you. God's done so much for you. And he says, pay attention. How does he say pay attention? Verse 12. Then beware. Caution. Watch out. Beware of what? Lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. What is he saying? Hey, beware lest thou quit having a consistent, personal, intimate, relationship, passionate relationship with the Almighty God. Beware lest you forget to have a private devotion, a time when you spend with God, you talk with God, you listen to God, you commune with God, you're intimate with God. That's what he's saying right there. Beware lest thou forget. Verse 13, thou shalt Fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall, ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are around about you. That's pertinent today. Amen? Amen. It's pertinent today. Thou shalt not. Don't go to those other gods. It's like, how could you even think of going to another god? Boy, God's been so good to you. How could you even glance that direction? How, in today's world and thought right there, how can you even glance at the broad way? How can you even desire to have what they want you to have? How can you even look that direction? Then it, it continues. I know, it's hard. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, Saul, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Mesa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto, the Lord, the, unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us up out from thence, and that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. By the way, those last five verses, you missed it. Maybe. When thy son comes and asks you about, why are we, why, why dad, do you have a personal relationship with God? Why are you so serious about serving the Lord God? Why are you careful with what you watch, Dad? Why are you careful with what you go, Mom and Dad? Why are you so guarded with your, your, with your being close to the world with those Ammonites and those uh, parasites in the land? Right? So he's asking why. 
And what he's saying to his children, he says, you don't understand. God's been good to us. Amen. Boy, he's, ta he's taken us from a, a bondage in Fer in, in, over in Egypt. He, we've come a long way. And I love God. I care for God. I have a real, consistent, passionate, wonderful, uh, loving relationship with God. Amen. And you begin to think about that. that. That's what God desires us to have. And most rebels, by the way, I'm going to go back to that saying, and we're going to move on. But, but you think about that. Most rebels, it really comes down to their relationship with the Lord. And how you said, I want to read it exactly so I don't mess that up, but um, it's worth waiting for. i got a patient congregation here. Patience. Oh. Most people who profess to be saved do not have a Deuteronomy chapter 6 relationship with God. Most people who are saved, even inside, can I say it, a church, don't really have a Deuteronomy chapter 6 relationship. Your kids know it. The people around you that are close to you, they know it. And it gets to a little bit, well, for example, a long time ago, I was in a church, and I had a Bible institute, and they had walking with God sheets. And it was a form you fill out every day showing that you walked with God. You know what I realized very quickly? Just because you were able to fill out a walking with God sheet didn't mean you really walked with God. And there's a big difference between filling out of a piece of paper, checking a box, and having a real, consistent, passionate relationship with the Almighty God. And the sad fact, sad, many people don't even know what that means. Right. Number three, a Christian who seeks to do the work of God and does not know how to walk with God or how to deal with their lusts will eventually rebel. Now, follow with me. I don't, I'm trying to get you. This is so important. A Christian who seeks to do the work of God, uh, seeks to serve God, but he doesn't end up knowing how to walk with God or deal with their lusts, their flesh, will eventually rebel against the Almighty God. Do I doubt that Saul wanted to serve the Almighty God? I don't doubt that. Do I doubt that Saul sincerely wanted to please God? I don't doubt it for a second. But he did not know how to biblically walk with God. He did not biblically know how to deal with the lusts of his flesh. And he eventually rebelled against the Almighty God. Sadly, this is a high percentage of Christians. When a person seeks to do the work of God, apart from an intimate relationship with the power of the Holy Spirit, they will soon wear out, burn out, be critical out, pride out, and eventually rebel out. A person who's do not, does not learn, who does not learn how to submit to God, and by the way, other biblical authority will, by the way, eventually have a struggle with pride, and the pride will lead to destruction. A person who rebels, uh, who is a rebel, he rebel, he's a, becomes a rebel because of his wondering heart. His heart begins to wander away from the Word of God. In other words, rebels are generally undisciplined people in their mind. They have no idea how to control their thought life, Many people are good at spiritualizing the rebellion. They make excuses for the rebellion. But let's be clear, rebels with wandering hearts do not like any authority in their life. It's hard. I know, I know, Pastor, you're getting a little carried away with this, but a Christian who seeks to do the work of God, apart from that intimate relationship with God, will eventually rebel. Pastor, are you sure about that? Yes. By the way, children can be rebels. Teenagers can be rebels. Adults can be rebels. Pastors can be rebels. Guilty sometimes. And where does it come from? James chapter 4, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? It says in verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is an enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a Friend of the world is the enemy of God. It continues on in verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. 
Uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. A little bit later, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the, uh, sight of the Lord. And we begin to look at that in a, just a glimpse of a fashion right there. The, the problem, if you want to do work for God and you never learn to have an intimate relationship with God, you'll burn out, rust out, criticize out, eventually rebel against the Almighty God. Rebellion, in its purest form, by the way, is a pride issue. It lacks humility. It lacks submission to God. Okay. I remember. I didn't understand. I got saved. And I got in a good church. People were on fire for God. And by the way, people did a work for God there. But I wondered, that we had Soul Winners of the Year, Soul Winner of the Year Award. And I remember the Soul Winner of the Year Award, it's often after they won Soul Winner of the Year Award, by the next year they were in an adulterous situation with somebody or they're out of church completely. And I wondered, man, how could somebody do such a work for God and all of a sudden be out of church the next year? It made absolute no sense to me. But in reality, it does make sense. Did they sincerely want to do a work for God? Yes. Did they want to do something for the Lord? Yes. But they never learned to have a real, passionate uh, uh, relation, Deuteronomy chapter 6 relationship with the Almighty God. Now, going a little bit further, leaders can cause people to rebel. Leaders can cause people to rebel. Ephesians chapter 6 speaks of a leader. And ye fathers, how many of your fathers? Provoke not your children to wrath. Provoke, don't provoke your children to have an anger where they uh, strongly uh, have a desire to avenge their wrath against them or their anger against them. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I, I put this, parents can cause rebellion. Parents can cause rebellion. By the way, I want to put this, pastors can cause rebellion. And I don't want to beat up on parents this evening. I am one. I don't want to beat up on pastors this evening, but I am one. And I talk to many a broken-hearted parents and pastors. Their hurt, their agony is real. And they look at the fruit of their provoking their children to wrath. They look at the fruit of provoking a congregation to wrath. And their hurt is real, but they can lose the heart of their children. They can lose the heart of their congregation. How? By having and using ungodly anger and a spirit of anger. This is so important. I don't need to shout it from the mountaintops, but, but you need to listen to this statement. We can lose the heart of our children very easily. We can lose the, the heart of a congregation very e easily. How? With ungodly anger and a spirit of anger. Many parents do this and don't even realize it. And it's the hidden sin of many independent Baptist pastors and parents. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Parents can cause rebellion in their children's lives because the parent is often in rebellion against God already. Amen. Anger is rebellion, is it not? Amen? Well, it's not right, is it? Oh, pastors can cause rebellion in the church member's life because a pastor is a rebel. I recently talked to a man, and man, the man is, by the way, at one point he was describing a time he was very angry with his pastor. He told me a story, and I spent a lot of time with him. His pastor did some unjust things. His pastor was extremely mean. His pastor was unkind. And this man got to the point, he said, I got so bitter against my pastor that I had the thought of taking a gun and killing him. He told me that. Some of you right now. <laughs> it's not good, okay? I see it in your eyes over there. And so you can say, I, I understand that, pastor. It's not good. It's not good. Uh, but praise God. This man I was speaking to, he said, he said, I then realized I needed to forgive and move on. Amen. Praise God he did. And he became a missionary, and he's now a pastor of a Bible-believing church. Amen. Which leads to this point. Pastors can cause rebellion in, in a church member's life because a pastor is rebel, but in the end, every person, every Christian 
has a responsibility for their own actions and reactions. In the end, they, they, the Father may provoke, but in the end, you, I, have a responsibility for our own actions and our own reactions. Amen. Church member, I may have in the past provoked you to anger. I may have provoked you to wrath. I'm guilty. But in the end, every person has a responsibility for their own actions and reactions. Let's be clear. You cannot blame your parents for every dumb decision you make in your life. Right. Amen. Amen. You can't blame your past. Well, you can. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Just because your parents or pastor are rebellious, they make poor decisions, they're inconsistent, is no reason for you to live a rebellious life. That's right. The Bible is true, still true even if your parents or pastor are or have been inconsistent. This is important. I, I try to be a good pastor, but I'll let you down. Your parents, I believe, often try to be good parents, but they'll often let you down. And I find many times a church pastor in the past has hurt a, a good person. And they carry that for the rest of the life. They never trust another pastor. They never uh, forgive that pastor from the past or that wound from the past. And they're hindered. And then they blame all their problems, their rebellion against God, against an authority in the past. It happens all the time. Adam blamed Eve. And Eve blamed the devil. A couple more thoughts. Grow up. Take responsibility for your own actions. Quit being a victim and realize that God can help you if you will submit yourself to Him. Hallelujah. Rules. Rebels do not like rules or authority. And I understand. Your parents may have let you down once again. A pastor may have let you down. By the way, a husband may have let you down. But every person has to learn to biblically submit to God and take responsibility for their actions, reactions, and decisions. And uh, it's a hard thing to learn as you grow up. You know, when you're in the house, mom and daddy take care of everything. I remember getting my first car, and I was going to take responsibility to change the oil. And I forgot to put the oil cap back on. <laughs> oil went everywhere. And I didn't understand why the car was smoking. I didn't understand why I burned up the engine. But I learned very quickly it was my fault. It was my fault. It didn't matter who didn't train me to change the oil right. It was my fault. My fault. My fault. Okay, we're almost done. Two or three or four or five more points. <laughs> Listen to this. Number six, getting away from the word of God leads to becoming a rebel. When you look at Saul, it says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And simply Saul did not perform the, the commandments of the Lord, didn't follow the word of God, he became a rebel. And we begin to think about that with our children. I think about my children in, in this situation. I, I try to take and lead my children to stop, to look, to listen, to obey. So I tell my kids, stop. Stop what you're doing. When daddy's talking to you, stop. Amen. When mommy's talking to you, stop. Amen. Look at me. Listen to what I have to say, then obey. But same thing with God. We ought to stop. We ought to look, we ought to listen, we ought to obey God. Amen. Let's be clear, the Bible is the authority in our life, it's not how we feel. Rebels live by feelings, right. which leads to our last point. This leads to a very important point. Rebels are not spiritually and emotionally mature people. Why? Because of pride. I've, I've, I've went along, I understand. And I'm going to be very, very quick with this, but with you, with me. How about you? Are you a rebel? Have you been saved? Do you have a real, consistent, passionate relationship with the Almighty God? Do you even know what that means? How about this one? Are you a leader that's caused rebellion in a follower? How about that for you, mom? How about that for you, dad? Pastor, get that relationship right and get it right quick. Ask for forgiveness. Don't blame others. Take responsibility. Have you gotten away from the Word of God? Hey, what about your pride? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven.